Hey, it's great to see you this morning. The pastor is in Missouri. I think pastor said that he's in Missouri with his mother celebrating the, her 88th birthday and his <clears throat> birthday. So I know what it is. If you want to know what it is, ask Pam. I'd like to begin by asking you a question. What do Christians really believe? What do Christians really believe? I'm in graduate school right now. It's called, called Barnes and Noble. And so I go to Barnes and Noble and I talk to all these people, to university students. Yesterday I was talking to, yesterday or Friday, I forget which day it was, I was talking to a man and his wife. He was an engineer. They were from Liverpool, uh, England, and have had a lot of conversations probably over the last four or five years with individuals. And I've discovered for, through them what the perception is of what Christians believe. The one perception is that all that Christians believe has to do with behavior, the how we act, what we do in certain situations. And so their, uh, their perception is that there are restrictions and releases, your do's and your don'ts. And so their concept of what a Christian is, a Christian believes certain things about actions, and that's primarily what they're about. The second group that I sort of see is that Christians' belief is based on practices. Some go to church, some don't. Golfers, they find God out on the ninth green, I guess. And uh, there are those that base everything on on the perception of our practices. There are others who have concluded that it's all about political orientation. If you see certain policies this way, you are a Christian. If you see certain policies this way, you are not a Christian. And so it is built upon those perceptions but I would suggest to you this morning that there are core beliefs that determine what it really means to be a Christian. And those core beliefs answer the whys, the whys of behavior, the whys of practices, sometimes even the whys of political policies. But what are those core beliefs and where do they come from? I would suggest to you this morning that Jesus Christ is the epicenter of the Christian faith. He is ground zero. He is at the core of everything that we seek to be, everything that we believe, everything that we hope, ultimately has a string that comes back to the person of Jesus Christ. No matter how therapeutic we find Jesus to be when we come into an auditorium like this with our cares and concerns of life and find comfort and consolation, and no matter how much he clarifies the morality or we clarify the morality of how we are to live our lives, understanding who Jesus is and knowing him in a personal way is at the very essence of what we are and need to be if we are truly Christian. It is all about Jesus. And from Jesus, everything 
flows out. Being a Christian is far more than a good feeling. Being a Christian is, uh, is far more than being optimistic or filled with hope. Being a Christian is much more than going to a church and sitting in a chair and listening to what goes on. Being a Christian is about embracing truths revealed by God through his sacred word. It is the discovery that there are things that God tells us in his word that we embrace into our lives. Being Christian is much more about what you possess in your mind than it is what you, what you feel in your emotions. Being a Christian. It doesn't take a graduate degree in theology like some of us have to be able to grasp that. But it does ask us to strive in our lives to capture a comprehensive understanding of who Jesus is. There's a game we used to play as children. At least I was a child when I played it. Maybe this will remind you of what it is. How many of you ever played dominoes, knocking them down that way? Hold your hands up. I want to see. Yeah, I'll tell you what, most of you. Now I'm going to find how honest you are. How many of you as children learned like me, as I learned from my cousins, that whenever you make the long line and you want, if you just carefully sneak one of those dominoes out, and the other person doesn't know that you're doing it, and they hit. How many of you learned to sneak a domino out to frustrate? Come on, I, raise your hand. I, am I the only? Am I? Well, there's two of us. There's three of us. Yeah. Come on over here. Come on over here. Come on over here. Come on up here. Right up. You can run. You can, I mean... How old are you? Twelve. Twelve. I just want you to know that this is a multi-generational sin. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> a multi-generational sin. But I learned that if you snuck one, just one domino out, you can distort the whole flow that takes place. I discovered if you snuck one domino out, that the sequential success that the person had anticipated would be removed just by taking one domino out. This morning, I'd like to perhaps reinsert a domino in your thinking of the flow of Christian truth and how Jesus Christ relates to you. You see, I hope to provide a deeper understanding of the comprehensive work of God on your behalf and in your life and the significance of it as it unfolds not only in these days but in the days ahead. Ascension Sunday is one of those Christian events that is hidden among the weeds of neglect. It's like an uh, old, rusty pickup truck hidden in the back edges of a farmer's field. There it is camouflaged by high grass and weeds, and it is hardly noticed by anyone. Ascension Sunday isn't one of those things that we often think about. It's not usually a focus that we bring into our minds. But uh, this morning, I'd like to take the weed whacker and work around it and try to expose it for some of our consideration today. 
Let me illustrate, because we're going to use the domino metaphor for a while. You remember the metaphor, the falling dominoes, they're connected to each other. You hit the first one, the second one goes. If you pull one out, you've created an issue. Well, let me illustrate this. This is not the sermon yet, but it's the illustration for the sermon, and we'll get to the sermon. Let's say we began in the beginning, and we put the first domino out there. The first domino would be the preexistence of God. It would say that there was a time before creation and all that we know, before all that existed, and there was a God there. And God was out there, and so God existed before anything we know. And then God, this God who existed before anything we know, decided to create what is around us. Now, that's significant because if you, take the first, if you take the first domino away, you say to yourself, you are either an atheist who does not believe in God, or you are an idolater who has created his own God. I can't explain everything about that God, but that first domino gave rise to the second domino, which is creation, which is significant because it says that that first God, that God, that first domino, created a world that is sacred and holy and valuable. And then it says that there was a third domino, the domino where God created people like us. And so it says that everybody created by this God who created creation then took the dust of the earth and created mankind and gave to them a sacredness that is such that there is absolutely no man or no woman of any color or any culture or any level of intelligence or lack of it who lives in a big home or lives in a shelter there is absolutely nobody who is not of value because they were created in the image of God. And so if you take out one of those dominoes, you distort the flow of God as God intended it to be. Now let me say to you that we don't have time for me to go through the whole Bible with the dominoes. So we will jump to the New Testament. And I would like to talk to you a few moments about those dominoes as it relates to the person of Jesus Christ. Now, even as I preached this this morning, I thought, man, I should have put this domino in. I should have put that domino in. But the fact of the matter is, I'm overeducated. And so it would mean that I would have to put so many in there to satisfy my professors. Because they're the voices that I hear in the back of my head. You need to know this. Never forget this. Always remember this. Tell people this. I mean, there's so much back there that I, I well, you'd be as confused as I am. <laughs> and I don't want to do that to you. Domino one. The great miracle that we celebrate on Christmas. There was a virgin by the name of Mary who conceived by the Holy Spirit of God in a miraculous way. A child in her womb. And it was for a very specific purpose, this child. Because it was declared that thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And this child was unlike any other child. 
And this woman and the birth of this child was unlike any other woman. And God became man and dwelt among us. And we beheld, as it were, the glory of the only begotten Son of God, full of grace and truth. Domino one. Domino two, Jesus takes three disciples, Peter, James, and John, and goes up to a mountain. And there, he has this unusual experience. The Bible calls it the transfiguration. He goes there, and there he encounters Moses, the giver of the law of the Pentateuch of the first five books of the Bible, and he encounters Elijah, representative of all the great prophets of God. Basically, they comprehend the whole Old Testament. And the Father shows up. And the glory of God radiates from Jesus. And these men see it and would later write about it. And the Father says, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. The third domino is the crucifixion. Jesus, upon the cross of Calvary, there is a crown of thorns on his head. There are nails in his hands and his feet and a piercing in his side and his blood is flowing. The Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. On the third day, the next domino appears, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He was dead, and now he is alive. And he is visibly seen by others. Which leads us to that next domino, which are the post-resurrection appearances of Jesus. One time he walks into a room. The closed door isn't a problem for him. He walks right through it. At another time, he gathers the disciples along the Sea of Galilee and serves them a meal. Pastor told us a couple weeks ago, uh, he, he walks with a few guys on the road to Emmaus and speaks to them. And of course, the scripture tells us at one time, one time, he gathered together with 500 people, all who had seen him. Those marvelous dominoes. Domino six, the disciples are gathered together with Jesus, and he ascends into heaven. That's what we were going to talk about today. He ascends into heaven. The next domino, he's gone to prepare a place for us that where he is, there we may be also. The next domino, he sits at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for us. Domino nine, he gives us this great gift, the gift of the Holy Spirit. For up to that point in time, to be with Jesus meant you had to see him with your eyes and touch him with your hands. But now, he says, the Holy Spirit is God in us through his marvelous and miraculous and supernatural presence. Domino 10. 
the second coming of Jesus Christ. Christ is coming again. He is coming again. The next is justice and judgment. For the Bible says that there will be a time when God brings justice to the face of the earth and judgment for all the injustices that have taken place in this universe. God is going to straighten it and deal with it all. Yours, mine, everybody's. The justice and the judgment of nations, of people groups, of individuals, God is going to deal with it all. And then domino 12, heaven. I've left out a lot of dominoes. You already know it. You've, you've got them in your mind. But you know what the problem was with the disciples on the day when Jesus ascended into heaven? The problem was they were stuck on domino five. Lord, is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? Even though they had been with Jesus for all this time, even though they had heard his teachings and seen his miraculous actions, even though they had, all that had taken place, they still hadn't caught that there is a different dimension to the universe than what we have ever experienced or seen. They were looking for Jesus to do for them what they wanted and what they thought they needed. The loss of national and personal freedom had so concerned them. It had been centuries since Israel had been able to exercise its own authority over itself. They had come, the Assyrians, the Chaldeans, the Persians, the Babylonians, now the Romans were there. And they had their boot upon their throat. And if there is anything that any of us as human beings resent, it is for somebody else to have their boot on our throat. And so the pain of the body or the pain in our heart can become so strong that we no longer think about the big pictures of God and the significant workings of God. We only think about what I feel I need to get this boot off my throat. They had a hard time thinking about it beyond that. And so they removed in their thinking the domino of the ascension. They removed it. Jesus, you're just here with us. You're here to do what we want. Jesus, you have to help us with what we need. Are you prepared, Jesus, to give the kingdom to Israel now, just as we want? You know, I feel sorry for these disciples. When Jesus was hanging on that cross, they felt totally abandoned by God. You know, Jesus, we started to walk with you. We started to share these moments together. We did all these incredible things, and you said all these marvelous truths. But there you are on the cross. You know, we left everything to follow you. And so most of them walked away. 
they felt abandoned by Jesus. I am told by those who study such things that abandonment is the worst, one of the worst psychological wounds that a person can experience. If you are a husband or a wife and you've ever had somebody turn their back on you or walk away from you or your parent did or someone significant in your life, you probably have a really deep wound in your heart. And they felt abandoned by Jesus up on that cross. And so three days later, whenever he was risen and he came to them, their hope was restored. Christ is here. He's going to help us. He really is going to make a difference in our lives. Christ is here. And now... Again, he, they feel like he's abandoning them. And so they had pulled out the ascension domino in the series. But just think, if we pull that out, what goes with it? I've gone to prepare a place for you. Nope. I sit at right the right hand of God the Father making intercession for you. Nope. I shall come again and receive you unto my... Nope. There will be justice and judgment. That... Nope. There will be heaven. Nope. Just by pulling out the ascension. The ascension and reminds us that there is more to our existence than we will ever understand. I have a friend, a dear friend, by the name of Keith Drury. He wrote on this, and since he's smarter than I am, I'll read what he wrote. At the very least, the ascension tells us that Jesus is still not walking the earth in bodily form. However, the more important implication is that the resurrected human body of Jesus ascended into heaven. Just think, the first human body is already in heaven the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the final resurrection, our bodies will simply follow the path that Christ has already taken. When I was a boy, a young boy, I lived in a house that had three steps like this. This was the landing into the porch. These were the two steps in our home. Those three steps are a significant, significant location in my life. When I was six years old, I had my two sisters. I think they're going to put that up there. Wasn't I handsome? So the three of us, me, my sister Audrey, and Charmaine, we lived in that house with those three steps. One night, one night, our dysfunctional home experienced a crisis that was shattering to us. We were one of those homes where verbal ab abuse was common. 
We, lo we learned at the age of six and four, my sister, we learned all the curse words. We knew them all because mom and dad said them to each other all the time. And every time they started these events, these verbal barrages, I would grab my sister Audrey and take her to the attic. And there we would find our protection up in the attic as mom and dad had these incredible encounters. But let me say this to you. I learned this at the house of those three steps. I learned that verbal abuse is only a trigger away from physical violence. And if you tolerate verbal abuse in your home or in your marriage, you will probably someday have to deal with physical violence in your relationship. And so we were in the home the night when it wasn't the first time, when the verbal abuse became physical violence. And I, as a six-year-old boy, that boy, watched my mother go down those three steps covered with blood from the violence that was going on in the home and she never came back. And so here we were. I was the big brother so I had the responsibility of giving some care until my dad was able to figure out what to do and then one day he came to me and he said, uh, I'm going to, something's going to happen tomorrow. And he introduced me to a word I didn't understand. He introduced me to the word adoption. And he told me that there would be some strangers coming tomorrow, people I'd never met. They were coming to get my two sisters. And so we packed all their clothes and uh, took their crib and tore it apart, stacked everything close to the front door, because just a little distance from those steps, there was an alleyway. And he said to me, he said, uh, something that no parent should ever do to their child. He used me to do what he should have done. And he said, you tell them that they're going on a vacation. But he told me, using that word, adoption. And so, on those steps, with my little feet, I took the small clothes, the dresses. I helped carry the pieces of the crib. I, I could remember, I remember it vividly. And they packed it in the car and they tied it on the roof and this lady that I had no idea who she was took my little sister, the baby still in diapers, and then took my four-year-old sister, Audrey, and put her in the car. The car went down the alley. My sister Audrey was screaming my name because I was her protector. I was the one who took her to the attic. She screamed my name. 
and the car went down, and I stood there and watched it go down the alley, turn to the right, and vanish. I used to go back to those steps and sit on them, and I would just sit for long periods of time, looking down the alley, hoping that the car would come back, but it never did. As time went on, he got married again, got divorced again, got married again, got divorced again, eventually sold the house, he got a car, I got a bike. That's sort of how parents pay off the kids, you know. And uh, life went on. I wanted to see them, but I didn't. I wanted to be with them, but I couldn't. They moved. They ended up around Chicago. The house was gone. The steps were gone. Life goes on. And after a while, you learn to live with the absence and with the pain. Alice and I got married on our 25th wedding anniversary. My incredible daughter, Tammy, who is here, made arrangements. And for the first time in 39 years, my two sisters and I were together. I had, I had longed more desperately than I can tell you for the days that I would see and be able to be with my sisters. Jesus Christ ascended to heaven that which the disciples long for and the New Testament reflects over and over again is for that reunion with Jesus. They talk about the day of the Lord, about Christ's coming back. If you take the ascension out, you lose all of that. But let me read to you what the Apostle Paul said. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, that is, those who have died, that you may not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord shall not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. But we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Now as to the times and the epics or seasons, brethren, we have no need for anyone, for anything to be written to you, for you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just as a thief in the night. While they were saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them, and suddenly the birth pangs upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, 
are not in darkness that the day should overtake you like a thief. For you are all sons of light and sons and daughters of day. We are not of night nor of darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and sober. For those who sleep do their sleeping at night, and those who get drunk get drunk at night. But since we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ who died for us, that whether we are awake or we are asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build up one another, just as you also are doing. 